information does the government need to make a decision on when to ease restrictions? Recorded deaths and infections are down today again, although hospital numbers are still high. The vaccine rollout has delivered more than 10 million first doses and the government has tonight announced the hotel quarantine scheme will start on the 15th of February to block further new variants. Today, the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady, a vocal critic of lockdown, said he would be delighted to follow Scotland and Wales' timescale for easing restrictions and rather than a phased return to school on March the 8th, in England opt for the earlier date of February the 22nd. So what are the competing pressures on Boris Johnson out with and from within his own backbenches? Nick Watts here, but first, Nick, that quarantine announcement tonight. Tell us more. Well, as you say, Kirsty, in the last few minutes, the government has finally set a date for the mandatory quarantining of all passengers arriving in the UK. The deaths are sitting... So but wouldn't you say the justification would be that we're sitting at 110,000 deaths and the death rate is still over a thousand a day. So we can't move too quickly. And if, as you say, we were to come out of lockdown on March the 8th, what if we had to go back to another? In your opinion, what should the levels be at to come out on the 8th of March? Well, I don't think that's the, the right criterion. So, point, because you can say we'll have, you know, at the moment we're sitting at 10 million first doses. But as you well know, people that are vaccinated can still transmit coronavirus. They are still necessarily infectious, possibly infectious, even after the second dose. So how can you justify saying, I'm starting at the wrong end? Well, because what you just asserted... Let, let's talk about the R number, because I know we want to stop transmission. But if the vaccine severely limits severe symptoms, but actually it still travels through the community, then the R number is still going to be up. And the truth, as you're saying, is that it's a clever, it's a very clever virus. It mutates a lot. And who's to say that it won't re-emerge as a very serious illness? Uh, uh, Indeed. So how do we pick ourselves up and pick our old lives up when the pandemic is over, especially when there's been so much trauma for many families, mental and physical, and bereavement, some without the chance to say goodbye? How does the NHS recover? How do children get back on track? Well, in a moment, we'll be joined by the country's foremost disaster relief advisor to explain. But first, Debs Cohen has this report. No problem. Now, what will define Joe Biden's response to events like those this week in Russia and Myanmar? Tonight, the president made his first big foreign policy speech since entering the White House. He'd already signaled a break with the Trump administration by setting America on course to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord and renewing the New START nuclear treaty with Moscow. I'm joined by our diplomatic editor, Mark Urban. Uh, Mark, first set piece, what was, the, was there a big message? Well, the big message was, I'm going to make this as different to President Trump's foreign policy as I possibly can. Literally, it was that crude. So whereas you might be quite muted, yes, tough words today about the uh, imprisonment of Alexei Navalny, but also he's just reinvigorated the START deal, the strategic arms deal with Russia. And you get the feeling that he really wants to get things back onto a harmonious track before he takes stands on issues. And you say China, and clearly China is pivotal. So what is this? Thanks very much indeed. Now, traditionally, the civil service is seen and not heard. Thousands of men and women whose task it is to develop and deliver government policies. But recently, it's never been free of controversy. First, the Brexiteers accused it of being a fifth column of Remainers. And when Dominic Cummings entered number 10, he said a hard rain would fall on the civil service. Well, he's out of Downing Street now, but ideas of reform linger. Well, now there's a unique insider view from the man who's at the very centre of power in Britain for more than 25 years and served for Prime Minister. Jeremy Haywood worked for Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron and Theresa May as Principal Private Secretary, Permanent Secretary of Number 10, Cabinet Secretary and Head of the Home Civil Service, retiring in 2018, only a few days before his untimely death from lung cancer. Before he died, his wife, Suzanne Hayward, herself a former senior civil servant, started working with him on his biography, 
what does Jeremy think? It's published today. And it's already been attacked by unnamed civil service managers opining that it's bad form and saying Jeremy would have published this, would he? I don't think so. Well, I sat down earlier this evening with Suzanne Hayward and be began by asking her, Jeremy, Jeremy navigated the relationship with so many different PMs. We had years and hopefully people can learn from that. Suzanne Hayward, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Just time to look at some of the front pages. Begin with The Guardian. There's that story, Hunt, Jeremy Hunt. Don't end lockdown until COVID cases fall to 1,000 a day. And on the left-hand side, anger over stark racial divide in the jab uptake. Ministers have been criticised for failing to act more urgency, urgently on vaccine disparities. Um, then The Times uh, on the left-hand side there, return of sport and socialising outdoors. Apparently that's the first thing that will come back after the schools. And on the right-hand side, government plans vaccine passport to allow holidays. The race started working on a vaccine passport as Greece prepares to waive quarantine rules for tourists who can prove they've been inoculated against the virus. In the middle there, Russians wearing on, on a red campaign online because Yulia Navalna was wearing red and so there's an online campaign of support for Russians to wear red. And in the Daily Telegraph, ministers to requisition 28,000 quarantine hotel rooms. But at the bottom, there's no case to delay school restart until March, say scientists. Well, that's all from us tonight. I'll be back tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.